Robert Edward Lee was born at Stratford Hall Plantation in Westmoreland County, Virginia, to Major General Henry Lee III, Governor of Virginia, and his second wife, Annie Hill Carter. His birth date has traditionally been recorded as January 19, 1807. Lee entered West Point in the summer of 1825. At the time, the focus of the curriculum was engineering. The head of the Army Corps of Engineers supervised the school, and the superintendent was an engineering officer. Cadets were not permitted to leave until they had finished two years of study, and were rarely allowed off the academy grounds. Lee graduated second in his class behind Charles Mason. In June 1829, Lee was commissioned a brevet second lieutenant in the Corps of Engineers. After graduation, while awaiting assignment, he returned to Virginia to find his mother on her deathbed. She died on July 26, 1829. On August 11, 1829, Lee was ordered to Cockspur Island, Georgia. The plan was to build a fort on the marshy island which would command the outlet of the Savannah River. Lee was involved in the early stages of construction as the island was being drained and built up. In 1831, it became apparent that the existing plan to build what became known as Fort Pulaski would have to be revamped, and Lee was transferred to Fort Monroe at the tip of the Virginia Peninsula. While home in the summer of 1829, Lee had apparently courted Mary Custis, whom he had known as a child. Custis refused Lee the first time he asked her to marry her. She accepted him with her father's consent in September of 1830, while he was on summer leave. While Lee was stationed at Fort Monroe, he married Mary Ann Randolph Custis, great-granddaughter of Martha Washington. The 3rd U.S. Artillery served as honor guard at the marriage. They eventually had seven children, three boys and four girls. Lee's duties at Fort Monroe were varied, typical of a junior officer, and ranged from budgeting to designing buildings. Life at Fort Monroe was marked by conflicts between artillery and engineering officers. Eventually, the War Department transferred all engineering officers away from Fort Monroe, except Lee, who was ordered to take up residence on the artificial island of Rip Rads across the river from Fort Monroe, where Fort Wool would eventually rise and continue work to improve the island. Lee duly moved there, then discharged all workers and informed the War Department he could not maintain laborers without the facilities of the fort. In October 1836, Lee was promoted to first lieutenant. Lee served as an assistant in the Chief Engineer's Office in Washington, D.C. from 1834 to 1837. As a first lieutenant of engineers in 1837, he supervised the engineering work for St. Louis Harbor and for the Upper Mississippi and Missouri River. Lee distinguished himself in the Mexican-American War. For the first time, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant met and worked with each other during the Mexican-American War. Both Lee and Grant participated in the march from the coastal town of Veracruz to Mexico City. Grant gained wartime experience as a quartermaster, Lee as an engineer who positioned troops and artillery. Both did their share of actual fighting. The Mexican-American War concluded on February 2, 1848. After the war, Lee spent three years at Fort Carroll in Baltimore Harbor. In 1852, Lee was appointed superintendent of the military academy at West Point. During his three years at West Point, Brevet Colonel Robert E. Lee improved the buildings and courses and spent much time with the cadets. Lee's oldest son, George Washington Custis Lee, attended West Point during his tenure. Lee was enormously relieved to receive a long-awaited promotion as second in command of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment in Texas in 1855. He served under Colonel Albert Sidney Johnson at Camp Cooper, Texas. Their mission was to protect settlers from attacks by the Apache and the Comanche. In 1855, his father-in-law died, creating a serious crisis when Lee took on the burden of executing the will. John Brown led a band of 21 abolitionists who seized the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia in October 1859, hoping to incite a slave rebellion. President James Buchanan gave Lee command of detachments of, of militia, soldiers, and the United States Marines to suppress the uprising and arrest its leaders. By the time Lee arrived that night, the militia on the site had surrounded Brown and his hostages. Lee attacked and Brown and his followers were captured after three minutes of fighting. Lee's summary report of the episode shows Lee believed it was, was the attempt of a fanatic or madman. In 1860, Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee relieved Major Henselman at Fort Brown. When Texas succeeded from the Union in February 1861, General David E. Twiggs surrendered all the American forces to the Texans. Twiggs immediately resigned from the U.S. Army and was made a Confederate general. The commanding general of the Union Army, Winford Scott, told President Abraham Lincoln 
that he wanted Lee for a top command. Lee returned to Washington, D.C. and was appointed Colonel of the 1st Regiment of Cavalry in March 1861. He had earlier been asked by one of the lieutenants if he intended to fight for the Confederacy or the Union, to which Lee replied, I shall never bear arms against the Union, but it may be necessary for me to carry a musket in defense of my native state, Virginia, in which case I shall not prove recreant to my duty. Meanwhile, Lee ignored an offer of command from the Confederate States of America. After Lincoln's calls for troops to put down the rebellion, it was obvious that Virginia would quickly succeed. Lee resigned from the United States Army. Lee resigned from the U.S. Army on April 20th and took up command of the Virginia State Forces on April 23rd. At the outbreak of war, Lee was appointed to command all of Virginia's forces, but upon the formation of the Confederate States Army, he was named one of its fivefold generals. Lee did not wear the insignia of a Confederate general, but only the three stores of a Confederate colonel, equivalent to his last U.S. Army rank. He did not intend to wear a general's insignia until the Civil War had been won and he could be promoted in peacetime to a general in the Confederate Army. Lee's first field assignment was commanding Confederate forces in Western Virginia, where he was defeated at the Battle of Cheat Mountain and was widely blamed for Confederate setbacks. He was then sent to organize the coastal defenses along the Carolina and Georgia seaboard on November 5, 1861. Between then and the fall of Fort Pulaski, April 11, 1862, he put in plan a defense of Savannah, Georgia that proved successful in blocking federal advance on Savannah. Behind Fort Pulaski on the Savannah River, Fort Jackson was improved and two additional batteries covered river approaches. In the face of the Union superiority in Navy, artillery, and infantry deployment, Lee was able to block any federal advance on Savannah, and at the same time, well-trained Georgia troops were released in time to meet McLennan's Peninsula Campaign. The city of Savannah would not fall until General Sherman's approach from the interior at the end of 1864. Lee was appointed military advisor to Confederate President Jefferson Davis, the former U.S. Secretary of War. Following the wounding of General Joseph E. Johnston at the Battle of Seven Pines on June 1, 1862, Lee assumed command of the Army of Northern Virginia, his first opportunity to lead an army in the field. In the spring of 1862, as part of the Peninsula Campaign, the Union Army of the Potomac under General George B. McLennan advanced upon Richmond from Fort Monroe, eventually reaching the eastern edges of the Confederate capital along the Chickahominy River. Lee then launched a series of attacks called the Seven Days Battles against McLennan's forces. Lee's assaults resulted in heavy Confederate casualties. They were marred by clumsy tactical performances by his division commanders. But his aggressive actions unnerved McClellan, who retreated to the point on the James River and abandoned the Peninsula Campaign. The Unionist setbacks impelled Lincoln to adopt a new relentless committed warfare. Three weeks after the Seven Days Battle, Lincoln informed his cabinet that he intended to issue an executive order to free slaves as a military necessity. After McClellan's retreat, Lee defeated another Union army at the Second Battle of Bull Run. Within 90 days of taking command, Lee had run McClellan off the peninsula, defeated John Pope at 2nd Manassas, and the battle lines had moved from 6 miles outside Richmond to 20 miles outside Washington, D.C. Lee then invaded Maryland, hoping to replenish his supplies and possibly influence the northern elections to fall in favor of ending the war. Lee urgently recalled Stonewall Jackson, concentrating his forces west of Antietam Creek near Sharpsburg, Maryland. In the bloodiest day of the war, with both sides suffering enormous losses, Lee withstood the Union assaults. He withdrew his battered army back to Virginia while President Abraham Lincoln used the Confederate reversal as an opportunity to announce the Emancipation Proclamation. Disappointed by McClellan's failure to destroy Lee's army, Lincoln named Ambrose Burnside as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Burnside ordered an attack across Rappahannock River at Fredericksburg. Delays in building bridges across the river allowed Lee's army ample time to organize strong defenses, and the frontal assault on December 13, 1862 was a disaster for the Union. After the bitter Union defeat at Fredericksburg, President Lincoln named Joseph Hooker commander of the Army of the Potomac. Hooker's advance to attack Lee in May 1863 near Chancellorsville, Virginia, was defeated by Lee and Stonewall Jackson's daring plan to divide the army and attack Hooker's flank. The top military advisors wanted to save Vicksburg, but Lee persuaded Davis to overrule them and authorize yet another invasion of the North. The immediate goal was to acquire urgently needed supplies from the rich farming districts of Pennsylvania. 
Lee's decision proved a significant strategic blunder and cost the Confederacy control of its western regions. In the summer of 1863, Lee invaded the North again, marching through western Maryland and into south central Pennsylvania. He encountered Union forces under George G. Meade at the three day Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania in July. While the first day of battle was controlled by the Confederates, key terrain that should have been taken by General Ewell was not. The second day ended with the Confederates unable to break the Union position and the Union being more solidified. Lee's decision on the third day was to launch a massive frontal assault on the center of the Union line was disastrous. The assault known as Pickett's Charge was repulsed and resulted in heavy Confederate losses. Lee was compelled to retreat. Despite flooded rivers that blocked his retreat, he escaped. Following his defeat at Gettysburg, Lee sent a letter of resignation to Confederate President Davis on August 8, 1863, but Davis refused Lee's request. In 1864, the new Union General-in-Chief, Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, sought to use his large advantages in manpower and material resources to destroy Lee's army by attrition, pitting Lee against his capital of Richmond. Lee successfully stopped each attack, but Grant with his superior numbers kept pushing each time a bit further to the southeast. Grant eventually was able to stealthily move his army across the James River. The siege of Petersburg lasted from June 1864 until March 1865, with Lee's outnumbered and poorly supplied army shrinking daily because of desertions. During this time, on January 31st, 1865, Lee was promoted to General-in-Chief of Confederate forces. As the South ran out of manpower, the issue of arming the slaves became paramount. As the Confederate Army was devastated by casualties, disease, and desertion, the Union attack on Petersburg succeeded on April 2nd, 1865. Lee abandoned Richmond, Virginia and retreated west. Lee then made an attempt to escape to the southwest and join up with Joseph E. Johnston's Army of Tennessee in North Carolina. However, his forces were soon surrounded and he surrendered them to Grant on April 9, 1865 at the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse. Other Confederate armies followed suit and the war soon ended. The day after his surrender, Lee issued his farewell address to his army. Lee resisted calls by some officers to reject surrender and allow small units to slip away into the mountains, setting up a guerrilla war. He insisted the war was over. So far from engaging in a war, to perpetrate slavery, I am rejoiced that slavery is abolished. I believe it will be greatly for the interests of the South. After the war, Lee did lose the right to vote as well as some property. Lee supported President Johnson's plan of re reconstruction. Lee generally supported civil rights for all as well as a system of free public schools for blacks but forthrightingly oppose allowing blacks to vote. My own opinion is that at this time they cannot vote intelligently, Lee stated. President Grant invited him to the White House in 1869 and he went. Lee's pre-war family home, the Curtis Lee Mansion, was seized by Union forces during the war and turned into Arlington National Cemetery. The family was compensated in 1883. Lee hoped to retire to a farm of his own, but he was too much a regional symbol to live in obscurity. From April to June 1865, he and his family resided in Richmond at the Stuart Lee House. He accepted an offer to serve as the president of Washington College, now Washington and Lee University, in Lexington, Virginia. Lee was well liked by the students, which enabled him to announce an honor system like West Point's, explaining, we have but one rule here, and it is that every student be a gentleman. To speed up national reconciliation, Lee recruited students from the North and made certain they were well treated on campus and in town. Previously, most students had been obliged to occupy the, the campus dormitories, while only the most mature were allowed to live off campus. Lee quickly reversed this rule, requiring most students to board off campus and allowing only the most mature to live in the dorms as a mark of privilege. The results of this policy were considered a success. In 1868, Lee's ally, Alexander H. H. Stewart drafted a public letter of endorsement for the Democratic Party's presidential campaign in which Horatio Seymour ran against Lee's old foe Republican Ulysses S. Grant. Lee signed it along with 31 other ex-Confederates. In his public statements and private correspondence, Lee argued that a tone of reconciliation and patience would further the interests of white Southerners better than hot-headed antagonism to federal authority or the use of violence. Lee repeatedly expelled white students from Washington College for violent attacks on local black men. 
In 1869-1870, he was a leader in successful efforts to establish state-funded schools for blacks. On September 28, 1870, Lee suffered a stroke. He died two weeks later, shortly after 9 a.m. on October 12, 1870, in Lexington, Virginia, from the effects of pneumonia. At first, no suitable coffin for the body could be located. The muddy roads were too flooded for anyone to get in or out of the town. An undertaker had ordered three from Rick that had reached Lexington, but due to unprecedented flooding from long-continued heavy rains, the caskets were washed down the Murray River. Two neighborhood boys found one of the coffins that had been swept ashore. Undamaged, it was used for the general's body, though it was a bit short for him. As a result, Lee was buried without shoes. He was buried underneath Lee Chapel at Washington and Lee University, where his body remains. Among Southerners, Lee came to be even more revered after his surrender than he had been during the war. His reputation continued to grow. By the end of the 19th century, his popularity had spread to the north. Eventually, the barracks at West Point, built in 1962, are named after him. Robert E. Lee is one of the figures depicted in bas relief carved into Stone Mountain near Atlanta. Accompanying him on the horseback, accompanying him on horseback in the relief are Stonewall Jackson and Jefferson Davis. In 1900, Lee was one of the first 29 individuals selected for the Hall of Fame for Great Americans, designed by Stanford White on the Bronx, New York campus of New York University, now a part of Bronx Community College. In more modern times, the M3 Lee tank produced in 1941 and 1942 was named after him. The Dodge Charger featured in the CBS television series, The Dukes of Hazard, was named the General Lee. 